Joseph Stefan Institute of University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. He obtained his PhD from the University of Ljubljana. After that, he moved to Italy for a postdoc position at the ENFN Frascati. To the, also, he is uh, a scientific associate at CERN. So the title of his talk is uh, outdated on the LHC the photon excess. So if you can hear me, uh, your name, maybe you can start the, your presentation. Yeah, sure. And you can share your screen and everything. OK, thank you. Let's see this. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. OK, good. OK, um, so I was uh, kindly asked to, uh, by the organizers to, to give you a short update on the, on the recent buzz in the uh, high energy phenol community. It's about the 750 the photon excess seen in, at the LHC. Uh, so um, as probably most of you already heard about this, uh, the first LHC 13 TV data uh, seem to exhibit an excess in the diphoton spectrum, um, which is uh, the excess is seen both by ATLAS and CMS. Um, and of course, uh, with any such early hints, it's most likely just a statistical fluctuation. But um, it's uh, I think it's um, timely to start considering what if it's not. Uh, and in the following, I will be um, I will consider the 750 GV diphoton excess. Assuming it's due to some real uh, new physics, and in particular, I will assume there is some new particle I will uh, commonly know, um, denote as S. Um, and I will try to address the following uh, issues. Uh, what can we learn about its production decays using existing data? Uh, in particular, uh, I'll, I'll deal with the consistency with other measurements and searches. And um, the second issue I'll try to address is what are the possible theoretical interpretations of this success? In particular, can S be embedded into solutions of some of the standard model existing uh, puzzles? And what are the associated predictions for related phenomenology? Um, so first, um, let me try to give you a, somehow a theorist uh, a summary of what the experimental measurements are, or searches are about. Uh, so what, what the experiment sees is a diphoton peak over a monotonously varying or, uh, in particular, falling background. And the search and, and, the, and the signature is theoretically very clean and experimentally simple. So th the background composition in this search is mostly coming from real diphoton events and also uh, a small fraction of photon jet events where a jet fakes uh, a photon. Um, the, the purity of the sample, so the fraction of events which actually contain two real hard uh, PT photons is very high and it's measured in the data. Um, the, uh, the background spectrum as fitted in regions away from the excess is actually has been found to be in good agreement with uh, next to next to linear order QCD predictions, although these are not actually used to normalize uh, the background or its, or its shape. Um, furthermore, uh, Atlas, is, uh, in particular, has uh, and CMS have looked at uh, more detail in more detail at the events in the excess region, and they don't seem to exhibit any unusual characteristics. In particular, they, they don't seem to exhibit uh, ec uh, um, considerable missing energy, uh, extra hadronic activity, um, unusual angular distributions, or similar. Of course, this is all with very limited current statistics, so it's not conclusive. Um, so in the following, I will assume, so taking into account this uh, information, I will assume we are dealing with a prompt single production of a resonance, S, and which decays to a two-body, via well, two-body decay to a pair of real photons. Um, given these assumptions, then uh, using the London Young theorem, we can imply that this resonance has to have spin 0, 2, or higher. Of course, um, other possibilities in this have been uh, proposed in the literature. Um, however, they typically require some tuning of parameters. In particular, instead of uh, considering uh, 
um, a single resonance decaying to the photons, one could consider uh, the production of resonance uh, associated with uh, through the decays of a heavier particle uh, associated with po possible some, possibly some dark matter, which would result uh, generically in some mix missing energy, or alternatively, the resonance could decay not directly to the photons, but to some lighter particles, which would in turn decay to photons, which which would uh, result in uh, culminated diphoton events, which could, in principle, be um, um, interpreted by the experiments as uh, si simple diphoton events. Uh, or one could even consider more complicated um, kinematics, uh, for example, cascade or three-body decays. Uh, so I will not, so th there, has, there has been various discussions in the literature about these possibilities. I will not dwell on them any further but we'll focus on the, the, on the first, perhaps the most simplest uh, possibility. Um, so then the main issue concerning production of S is actually ensuring or testing compatibility with, between the data taken at 8 TV and 13 TV. Now, um, since uh, the ratio of the um, expected event rates at 8 TV and 13 TV depends on the enhancement of the cross-section, of the production cross-section between uh, these two energies, uh, this one can use this to infer on the preferred production modes of S. Uh, in particular, uh, in these uh, two figures that I'm showing, so the, the left-hand one uh, assumes a narrow width, and the right-hand one assumes a width of uh, roughly 6%. And here, what I'm showing here are the um, and the chi-squared functions, which combine the 8 TV and 13 TV searches by CMS in blue and Atlas in red. Uh, just let me check if there is a problem. No, there is no problem. Okay. Um, so if, in case you don't hear me, just let me know. Okay. Um, or there is another problem. So um, I'm, here I'm showing the so the combined 8 and 13 TV uh, diphoton search results of CMS in blue and Atlas in red, given the two width hypotheses, either narrow or wide width. And in black is the combined uh, chi-squared. Um, and you see, uh, on uh, just for illustration, on top of this, I've sketched the, so this is all plotted as a function of this enhancement factor of the cross-section between the 8TV and 13TV data. And for illustration on top of it, I'm, I'm, I'm plotting the expected ratios of these cross-sections if the production of S is dominated by particular uh, initial state patterns. Uh, the largest enhancement, are, of course, expected for heavy flavor uh, quark-antiquark annihilation and for gluon fusion. Um, on the other hand, in case this was a pure uh, uh, photon fusion um, production, the expected production enhancement between 8 and 13 TV would be actually very small, um, certainly below a factor of 3 or so. And what we see in, in this, these two plots is that current uh, combination of 8 and 13 TV data already tells us that uh, production from heavy flavor or gluon fusion is, is preferred. Uh, to have better consistency between these two. Um, of course, the conclusion also depends somewhat on the assumed width, because the significances uh, of the excesses in 8 and 30 bit data um, depend on the width assumptions. And they are somewhat different in CMS and Atlas. In particular, the Atlas data uh, ha exhibit larger significance of the excess in a large width hypothesis, while the CMS data uh, exhibit somewhat larger uh, significance of the excess in both 8 and 13 TV, uh, assuming a narrow width um, resonance. So um, from also from, from this exercise, one can already infer a, pro, a preferred uh, production cross-section of a diphoton resonance at 13 TV. And this varies between 3 and 10 inverse femtobarns. And the, the, this wide range covers actually uh, all the possibilities regarding this, the width and the spin. Okay, so, in particular, a larger width uh, and uh, spin 2 um, in, imply a larger cross-section. Okay. Um, so, um, the other conclusion one can draw 
one can draw from this uh, plot is that pure photon fusion, as I said, is uh, disfavored. What this tells us is that this resonant S has to have at least two decay modes. So it, it cannot only couple two photons, which is already very help helpful. Um, the second issue, as I, um, as I discussed, is the, the issue of the width of the resonance. In particular, the, ad, the ATLAS data seem to prefer a sizable width, while the CMS excesses in both 1832 TV data are more significant uh, if, if narrow. And combined, this actually results in no preference for S width if one combines uh, both ATLAS and CMS. And this is seen in these two plots, where I plot now the chi-square of the significance of the excess over the background-only hypothesis, combining CMS and ATLAS and also 8 and 13 TV data, again, as a function of the enhancement of the cross-section between the 8 and 13 TV. And we see that the combined significance at very high enhancements, so when 13 TV data dominates, is, there, is uh, roughly the same for narrow or wide width, one, once one combines CMS and ATLAS, which have different preferences. Um, another difference between CMS and ATLAS uh, analysis is that the CMS, the most sensitive CMS analysis, or the CMS analysis which exhibits the largest uh, excess, is an inclusive analysis, meaning that the PT of the photons is fixed and it's not very high, it's 75 GV. On the other hand, ATLAS has two analysis, two public analysis, and the one which exhibits a slightly more significant excess actually uses a harder PT cut on the photons. In particular, the leading photon is required to have 0.4, um, um, has, has to have PT of more than 0.4 of the environment mass of the photon event. And the subleading has to have at least 0.3. And so um, combined, again, um, these, uh, this cut, these different significances, uh, assuming different photon cuts, uh, currently do not exhibit any preference for either spin 0 or spin 2. So just for those of you who may wonder why one would have this sensitivity is that typically while spin 0 uh, predicts a boost invariant isotropic distribution of photons, spin 2 actually uh, prefers a more forward, uh, a more, more forward photons. Uh, so would prefer a more inclusive uh, analysis in, in principle. OK, so now we, we know that S has to couple at least to two channels. Um, so we can now do the following exercise. We can assume that S only couples to production channel and to photons, which are the observed decay channel. Then the system is actually completely constrained. And we can plot the uh, preferred parameter regions in terms of these two widths. For example, we can choose a dominant gluon fusion mo production mode and the diphotonic decay mode. And we can plot the preferred uh, range of uh, parameters in, in this plane, given the current uh, measurements. And in particular, if we assume these, these two decay modes are the only ones uh, significant for, for S, then we have this uh, range of parameters which are preferred. If instead, we actually require that the width would be wide as preferred by Atlas data, then we, the, the range of parameters would be required to lie in this uh, upper uh, uh, band here. So anything between th these two bands is actually perfectly allowed by current data. Um, and the second feature of these plots, so the, the right-hand plot is the same one as the left-hand one, just f assuming the dominant production coming from VB bar instead of gluon fusion. And basically, all the other heavy flavor production modes would lie somewhere between these two. These are the extreme possibilities, because the gluon fusion has the largest luminosity at 750 GV, and the BB bar has the smallest luminosity. Um, and so uh, the second feature of these two plots is that, um, of course, if, uh, if the production, if the decay width uh, dominating the production mode is uh, lowered, that at some point, uh, photon fusion production starts becoming important. And since photon fusion is disfavored when comparing 8 TV and 13 TV data, this tells us that this uh, upper uh, left corner of the parameter space is disfavored simply from compatibility between 8 and 13 TV uh, data. So this limits the, the preferred region to this, uh, this uh, 
lower uh, right-handed parts of the plots here. And furthermore, on the, on the uppermost right-hand side of these plots, one see constraints coming from actually searching for uh, digit resonances. And this is important because if, if this S couples dominantly to gluons or, or quarks, then it will also tend to decay to these uh, final states, and thus it can be searched for in, uh, in the form of digit resonance searches. And these are the current constraints still coming from ATV uh, data, superimposed. In particular, in the case of gluon fusion, it tells us that the, um, the gluon fusion and the photon decay modes alone cannot saturate a large width. Okay, because they would be excluded by digest resonance searches. So this, of course, tells us, on the other hand, tells us that there is room for additional decay modes of S. So one should look for those. And one can, um, one can uh, make a compilation of current bounds on possible decay modes of S to various star model final states. Uh, most of these co current constraints still come from ATV LHC data, but some have been recently updated with 13 TV searches. Um, but the, the numbers in this, in this table do not change by more than order one numbers, uh, if one, order one factors, if one includes the 13 TV results. Uh, in particular, what we see that is that um, uh, constraints coming from uh, ATV searches are more significant in if S was, was to decay to dileptons. Um, and, uh, and electroweak final states, in particular Z gamma, Z Z, or Z Higgs, or, di or even di Higgs or W plus W minus. The least constrained uh, decay mode, possible decay modes of, of S are, of course, hadronic decay modes, namely TT bar, B bar, or light jets, and also the, the possibly invisible decay width of S. So combining all this information, one can now play the following game. One can see, one can use the same uh, technique as before, but instead of just leaving the third possible, additional possible decay modes of S free, one can assume that the total decay width of S is now saturated by a single additional decay mode. And this leads to this uh, parameter space plot on the, on the left-hand side here, where the different coloring regions now refer to saturating the decay width of S with different a standard model final states. And what we observe here is that, in, per in particular, that um, almost uh, so any electroweak or leptonic final states cannot serve to saturate a large width of S. So they cannot significantly contribute to the decay width um, of S. While this is still allowed if one assumes either an invisible decay width or uh, decays to, uh, to heavy flavor. Uh, quarks. Um, so again, one can turn this around and say, if S does not couple significantly to star model quarks, and one wants to saturate a sizable width, then this is most easily done by decays to non-star model final states. In particular, it's possible for S to decay invisibly. Um, and this is something that actually can be tested with uh, using uh, something similar to uh, VBF tag production, so vector boson fusion tag production uh, used in, in Higgs measurements, but uh, due to lack of time, I will not uh, discuss this further. Um, so, but what I would like to uh, uh, um, explore a, bit, a little bit deeper is this connection with uh, our implications of a possible invisible decay width. In particular, on the right-hand side plot, we can see that um, given a possible uh, dominant production mode of S, so being either glue-glue which, or, or heavy flavor, which are preferred, uh, we can see that the uh, contribution of the possible invisible decay mode of M, uh, decay mode of, uh, of S, can easily saturate uh, a sizable decay rate. Um, and being in being, uh, um, accordance with the current bounds on um, missing energy signatures at the LHC. So if S was to decay invisibly, then one could uh, speculate that it could have some connections with dark matter. And this has been explored in depth in several uh, studies already. 
And what is interesting about this possibility is that one uh, obtains correlated effects in both the S width, uh, but also in, in the dark matter relic abundance, and in both direct and indirect um, dark matter detection experiments. And here I'm just showing a simple example where um, I'm assuming S is a scalar, and it's, uh, it's coupled to uh, fermionic dark matter. Uh, and then one can uh, superimpose all these constraints on a single uh, plot, namely um, the required scalar coupling, so the effective dark matter Yukawa coupling to S, uh, as a function of the dark matter mass. Um, then the uh, saturating the uh, measured dark matter abundance uh, singles out a preferred uh, region in the parameter space. And then this can be matched onto the effective uh, invisible decay width of S. Uh, and this is, of course, these two constraints can only be uh, saturated at individual points in the parameter space. And this should be contrasted now with constraints coming from uh, direct detection, which then actually depend on how S is dominantly produced. In particular, if S couples to light quarks, uh, direct detection in, in the form of here, parameterizing in, in the form of uh, spin-independent uh, scattering cross-section on protons um, already uh, severely would, would already severely constrain uh, such possibilities and would actually um, disfavor completely, uh, basically completely exclude uh, saturating the width of S uh, with the dark matter decays. So with such an exercise, we'll see that the preferred region the preferred production mode in this case, in this very simplistic models, would be coming from gluon fusion uh, and uh, possibly uh, BB bar. OK, so the, just to, uh, to make clear, the, the two plots refer to either scalar or pseudoscalar uh, couplings of S to dark matter. Uh, otherwise, they are not. The, the particularity of the pseudoscalar dark matter uh, coupling is, of course, that uh, in this case, the spin-independent uh, uh, dark matter scattering cross-section vanishes. So the the bounds coming from um, direct detection, direct dark matter detection experiments, are much much weaker and do not are not shown in this plot. Okay, so the second uh, more um, theoretical issue I want to discuss is how generic is such phenomenology. So how generically do one, does one expect a diphoton resonance uh, at the LHC to be a, a first sign of some new physics? And this can be done um, using effective field theory methods. And as an example, let me consider S as a standard model singlet scalar. Now, if, if this is so, then all interactions to standard model except the Higgs portal would be irrelevant interactions. So naively, one would expect to see a resonance not in diphotons, but in the Higgs final states. Okay, so this would be uh, the, the leading interaction one, one would expect in an effective field theory description of, of a uh, star model singlet scalar. Of course, the, the easiest way to forbid such dominant decay modes is to assume uh, an approximate CP conservation in, in this sector and assume that S is a pseudo scalar. Then, of course, these interactions are forbidden by CP. And then the next uh, interactions with the power counting of such an EFT are actually couplings to gauge field strengths. And then these can, in fact, dominate phenomenology. Um, and this is where the interesting uh, discussion enters. Namely that uh, assuming a standard model uh, gauge invariance then automatically correlates uh, the diphoton uh, width with other, so with decay widths to other electric final states. In particular, uh, looking at these uh, op possible operators in the leading uh, power counting on the EFT, we see that there are only, for a given CP assignment of S, one only has two possible operators with two different SU2 quantum numbers, uh, contributing, which can contribute to the diphotonic uh, width of S. In particular, if in the limits where only one of these two possible operators uh, is dominant, one gets definite predictions for the widths of S into uh, other uh, electric final states, in particular 
uh, one sees that the current bounds coming from uh, ZZ and WW searches, resonances in WW, decaying to ZZ and WW final states already exclude the possibility of S coupling predominantly to uh, SU2 triplet um, uh, gauge field strengths. Um, so more generally, so given that there are only two operators, we can more generally write uh, so-called decay amplitude sum rules uh, combining the measurements of all the uh, four uh, um, at possible decay uh, as decay widths to electric final states, and uh, uh, these uh, um, decay amplitude sum rules rely only upon um, SU2 invariants. Uh, of course, uh, they can be phrased in terms of uh, um, decays or ratios of decays, and uh, applying them to uh, the three or, or the so assuming the so normalizing all the remaining three possible electric final states to the to the diphonic to the measured diphotonic rate, um, one sees that uh, all the uh, uh, by so one can then correlate the uh, the case to Z gamma, for example, with the decays to ZZ or WW. And in these correlation plots, uh, one sees that depending, so irrespective of the possible interferences between these uh, amplitudes which enter these decay modes, um, at least two additional electroweak modes uh, should be non vanishing, uh, irrespective of the combination of the operators contributing to these modes. Okay? So this is a clear experimental target that we know that uh, of the four possible um, electroweak final states of S, given that experiments have observed uh, one of them, at least two further more should be uh, non-vanishing, so should be observable. Um, and uh, so, so on the... Um, so on the on the left hand side, I'm I'm superimposing the so the ratios of ZZ and WW and also the possible uh, the current experimental constraints on these ratios. So in gray is the current experimental bound on Z gamma, in red on ZZ and on, in blue on WW. But what could also what can also do a similar plot by just projecting uh, this uh, three dimensional <coughs> surface onto a two dimensional plane and then plot the uh, expected rate of, maximum rate of uh, WW decay width uh, or uh, as a function of uh, Z gamma or ZZ width, okay? And so these are the contours of constant RWW. And again, uh, superimposed are the current uh, experimental bounds. Okay, so uh, this... Uh, the simple uh, amplitude uh, sum rules that I presented uh, two slides before are, of course, uh, applied to the transverse modes, uh, so uh, to the transverse transverse modes of the of the electric gauge bosons. So there are slight modifications in presence of possible Higgs operators, so coupling S to the Higgses. Um, but the the numerical plots, these two numerical plots that I showed here, are actually already including possible contributions of this. Uh, um, additional contributions, which would induce the case of S two longitudinal decay modes uh, of the of the Ws in the Z. Um, on the other hand, violation of these uh, sum rules or violation of these um, uh, uh, constraints would indicate a violation uh, would indicate a break breakdown of the EFT power counting. In particular, the leading operator, which allows one to completely decouple the diphotonic decay width of the rest is of dimension 9, okay? While the leading operator contributing in the EFT to the diphotonic decay width was of dimension 5. So it's a, it's a very significant breakdown of the EFT power counting that, it, that would be required if no, uh, uh, no other electric decay mode of S was found. Um, this uh, discussion uh, can, of course, be generalized for S of li larger isospin representations and also for spin two, um, and you can you can find the details in the in the publications, and I will not um, um, discuss it further, but we'll move on 
Um, on, um, on another related issue, which is the possibility to disentangle uh, the electric nature of S. Namely, um, um, f until now I've, I've always discussed the example of S being a singlet, but this is, of course, not given. Uh, and there are, po there are possible experimental tests where, we, where one could test uh, the, the, uh, whether S is, in fact, a singlet or maybe a, a neutral component of a larger electroweak multiplet. Uh, one example is looking for associated production of S with a longitudinally polarized um, uh, electroweak gauge boson. Uh, and in particular, one can show uh, rigorously that a a stanomal singlet coupled to uh, QQ bar will predict a hard QQ bar uh, spectrum, uh, a hard spectrum of, of uh, production of S associated with the longitudinal electric gauge boson when produced from QQ bar interest. And this can be uh, this can be seen in the um, uh, in the left hand side plot here, where um, I'm using a BB bar. Uh, uh, annihilation production with for a given value of the effective uh, coupling to B, of S to B quarks, and you see that for S uh, being a singlet, the the PT spectrum of S or or Z or W is much much harder than in the case where S uh, is a neutral component of a, uh, of an electric doublet, and it goes back to the fact that. The Yukawa couplings to thermal quarks are irrelevant operators if S is a singlet, while they are normalizable operators if S is a, uh, a part of a doublet. Uh, a similar argument, one, one can do a similar argument for a doublet coupled to uh, uh, gluon field strengths. In this case, one can also predict that uh, the spectrum of S produced in associated with the uh, longitudinal mode of electric gauge, uh, gauge boson will be harder uh, in case S is a doublet. Um, but of course, discerning these two possibilities requires one to disentangle domin the dominant production mode. And this can also be tested by looking at events where S is recoiling against uh, hard hadronic uh, jets or B jets. And this has been shown recently that using um, this method, one can actually uh, disentangle the possible dominant production modes. Uh, of S, coupling to different uh, initial state particles. Um, OK, so the, so I guess I only have like five minutes left or so. No, you have more time. You can. I, you can I have more time? If, yeah. OK, OK. So then I'll, otherwise I would have skipped this. But um, um, so let me just briefly go through this uh, argument, namely, um, a possible size of total width is uh, a challenge for perturbative weakly coupled uh, models. And this can be uh, most easily shown, again, for the thermal singlet scalar case. Now, in this case, the, if, if S is, has a sizable width of like 0.6, then um, this puts uh, lower bounds on the effective, uh, of the effective scales suppressing the effective operators coupling S to gluons and photons. And uh, the uh, the most probably at the moment the most popular UV completion of such an effective theory is in terms of some uh, heavy vector-like fermions with masses comparable or larger than those that of S. Um, and then one can write the dominant interactions of these fermions to S in terms of effective Yukawa couplings, and these will at one loop level generate these effective op dimension five operators coupling S to gluons or photons. Now. One can do a matching of the EFT to these uh, perturbative models, and one see that one then sees that uh, these uh, uh, perturbative realizations come with severe suppression factors coming from the loop expansion or perturbative coupling expansion, which turns out to be uh, the leading contribution turns out to be at one loop. And so, um, since this suppression factor uh, is already bigger than the so it's larger than the inferred suppression uh, that is required to fit the data. This leads us to um, the theory, these, these models or theories, to live in the regime of, of large Hoft coupling. 
Um, namely, one either needs large couplings or large multiplicity of states. Um, and so to, to test the uh, validity or, or to constrain the regime of validity of such uh, perturbative descriptions, one should, of course, examine the RGs of the, the models. And uh, a particular observable, which is very sensitive to any uh, um, large couplings of multiplicities, multiplicities in a theory, is, of course, the quartic of the scalar in the theory, because it's sensitive to all interactions coupling to S. In particular, one can show that the beta function of the, of the S quartic receives uh, a large corrections um, which are uh, both due to the quartic itself and due to the um, possible Yukawa interactions of, of additional heavy fermions. And this can then be used to put uh, a bound on the, uh, on, on the Yukawa couplings, multiplicities, and charges of uh, hypothetical new heavy fermions um, generating the effective couplings of S to photons and gluons. And uh, a conservative uh, bound that one can impose is that the uh, beta function of the, uh, of the quartic should not exceed 16 pi. Okay? So, because w the, the argument goes is that if the beta function exceeds, uh, uh, is, is very large, then this means that basically the theory will run into a Lando pole or an instability within a decade of running. So basically, the, the validity of theory is restricted to, to within less than an uh, order of magnitude of where it's defined. So it basically becomes meaningless to talk about a perturbative description, description of such a theory. Um, and one sees that this actually allows one to put constraints on both the, um, um, the required couplings, so you cover couplings of, of these extra fermions. In particular, one is forced to live in, in a regime uh, of, of large, either large charges or large multiplicities. So one can, of course, more generally, one can also uh, look at the, not only the running of the, of the uh, quartic of S, but also of the other parameters of the models, in particular of the Yukawas itself, themselves, and also of the gauge couplings. And one can combine all of these cons uh, different RGE constraints uh, to, to constrain the parameter space of such perturbative models. Um, and we see that even though one is, there are, uh, this is again for a particular example, although there are regions of parameter space where these models are valid, uh, at least in a, in a limited regime of energies, this regime is actually very narrow. So typically, within uh, a few TeV, uh, this, this theory is run into, um, into some non-perturbative uh, phenomenon. Um, <clears throat> so there is a, so there are also, of course, co similar constraints one can evoke coming from both vacuum stability and also unitarity of processes involving S and these uh, heavy fermions. And all of them point to the re realization that generically perturbative models of, of S, if they try to accommodate a sizable width, uh, have a very limited range of validity, in, in particular, typically below a few TV. Um, there is one caveat uh, or one loophole that one can exploit. In particular, this, uh, this conclusion can be avoided if these new interactions which generate the, the cuttings of S to gluons and photons are, uh, reside near an infrared fixed point. They exhibit an infrared fixed point, then um, uh, a large coupling regime can be valid even to arbitrary high uh, scales. Uh, but it's very theoretically restricted, of course, to, to actually have such an infrared fixed point. Um, and this, what is interesting also is that this regime of large couplings can actually be, again, can be tested experimentally. This, in this case, uh, the relevant observable is S pair production, which would be anomalously enhanced if uh, heavy fermions coupling to S have very large Yukawa couplings. OK, so um, let, me, let me use the uh, remaining uh, couple of minutes to, to now focus on the, the other possibility, namely that S is more effectively described in terms of some strong dynamics. So in, 
being interpreted as a composite uh, state. And uh, to motivate, if we if we look at just the 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 composite theory we all know, namely QCD, and look at the neutral resonances um, appearing in QCD, we see that the their widths are generically of the right size, um, so they're generically uh, broad. Which which one would one expects in in composite or uh, strongly coupled theories? Now there are there are a plethora of candidates which appear in strongly coupled models uh, of new physics, which one might consider as uh, candidates for the diphoton uh, resonance, in particular in models of uh, composite Higgs, which are which address the electric hierarchy problem. One typically encounters scalar resonances. Uh, but also uh, additional uh, pseudo Goldstone bosons in addition to the Higgs boson. And generically, in theories exhibiting a high scale conformal symmetry, there is also a dilaton. Um, similarly, in, in strongly coupled theories, which are not directly, necessarily not directly related to the electroweak scale, which go under the term vector like confinement, um, one generically encounters, again, uh, uh, pseudo Goldstone bosons, which uh, can be thought of as some techni uh, interaction uh, form of, uh, of the eta meson. Or one can think of more massive uh, quonium-like, so QQ bar-like um, states. Of course, these uh, uh, strongly uh, interacting theories can often be reinterpreted and discussed also in, in terms of models with, with extra warp dimensions. In this case, for example, one can identify models of the dilaton in terms of a radian, uh, although there is a special uh, example where these interpretations are especially useful, these extra dimensional interpretations, is the case of spin two. So these extra dimension models are, are rare exceptions where I, one can actually uh, discuss on a firm footing uh, the possibility that S uh, has a, a spin two, okay, which is otherwise very difficult in a in a purely four dimensional setting. In this case, of course, S would be interpreted as a KK gravity, and there is uh, already some literature on it, and I will not have time to discuss this in, in detail. And uh, so, do I still have a minute, or I should skip the the last two slides? No, you can you can say it. Yeah, you can continue. Okay, so just because it's it's something that I've recently worked on, and because I think it's something that has not been uh, discussed so much uh, in the literature, especially not before uh, the diphoton resonance appears. Let me discuss briefly the the case of quonium because it's also possibly not so well known. Um, so this uh, this QQ bar like uh, states appear in uh, models of vector like. Uh, confinement, I, I also tend to think of them as, as like technical or like theories, but where the electroweak symmetry is not broken by technical or dynamics. Um, so these, these states appear where the, um, the fermions charge under these technical or uh, confining uh, interactions uh, have vector like masses which are comparable or above the confinement scale of the strong interactions. Um, then, in this case, the lightest scalars, the lightest states in the theory, uh, can be bound QQ bar states and, uh, of course, um, technical glue balls. And uh, a clear prediction uh, in this case is that for these uh, uh, heavy fermions residing in a given standard model representation R, uh, one can expect resonances appearing in the product representations of R times R bar. In particular, uh, one ex generically expects colored resonances of spin both 0 and 1. Uh, a typical spectrum of these resonances is shown uh, on the right-hand side here, where the lightest one is typically expected to have uh, to be uh, a scalar of uh, odd parity, so in particular a pseudoscalar. But one also expects an almost degenerate spin 1 uh, vector with otherwise the same electroweak quantum numbers, while um, and the other higher uh, excited states are excited to be heavier. Um, so since I, but all of these states should come both in, as 
uh, QCD singlets, and also octets. And this is a, a very interesting prediction of, of this construction. In particular, there, all the most relevant phenomenology, namely the decay rates and prompt production of the lowest lying resonances, is controlled by very few parameters. In particular, specifying the standard model representations of these uh, vector-like fermions and the basic parameters of the confining interactions, uh, one can determine or parameterize all the leading decay modes and production modes of both spin 0 and spin 1 resonances. Uh, and the important parameters uh, coming from the strongly interacting sector is, of course, the binding energy of these resonances and the size of the bound state, which can be also parameterized in terms of the wave function, the q cuber wave function at the origin for these bound states. Um, one can ask, one, some form of estimate of these quantities can be also obtained in the Coulomb limit, uh, where um, one can just uh, compute these uh, bound state states um, perturbatively. Um, so in this case, the digit resonance signal, which is very already constraining in case of gluon fusion dominated production of S, is now dominated by color octet partners of S. And this can be used to constrain the possible quantum numbers, standard model quantum numbers of these heavy fermions. In particular, current bounds already constrain the charge or the hypercharge in case of SU2 singlets uh, of these uh, heavy fermions to be above 0.6. Okay? And another interesting phenomenon that, that appears here is that besides prompt production, one expects to have this S and its uh, colored and higher spin partners to be pr also produced from fragmentation of uh, QQ bar production at high PT. And one can actually compare these production modes and the, the relevant phenomenology in terms of just two basic parameters as a stress, the binding energy and the size of the bound states. And uh, superimposing all of these constraints in terms of these two parameters, one can first see that a good fit to data is possible even close to the Coulomb limit. So the Coulomb limit on this plot is this uh, uh, purple dashed line here. And uh, superimposed on this are uh, the uh, perturbative production cross-section for heavy colored fermions and normalized to the number of uh, technicolors in pico bar, and in blue is the ratio of the prompt production normalized to this uh, perturbative QQ bar production. And we can see that um, the, the prompt production can easily uh, dominate uh, perturbative production. So estimating the total production via this prompt production can be uh, a valid uh, exercise in a region of parameter space. And furthermore, on the, the same plot, I'm plotting, I'm showing three examples of models where these heavy fermions have particular standard model representations, referring to U. So basically, this is an uh, SU2 singlet which charge uh, through thirds. And then I, I plot also two different possibilities: either an SU2 singlet with charge four thirds, or an SU2 doublet with uh, hypercharge five sixths. Um, and what, what we also, just for illustration, I'm also showing on the same plot uh, the values of the binding energy and uh, uh, the wave function, which would correspond to the known uh, QQ bar bound states of the standard model quarks, namely the eta B and the eta C. So the, the bottomonium and charmonium, lowest lying bottomonium and charmonium resonances. Um, and what we also see from this plot is actually there is room for additional decay modes of of this uh, uh, quonium, uh, which would push, if one adds additional pro uh, uh, decay modes, one pushes these preferred regions for these uh, benchmark models upwards, okay, towards larger values of, um, of the wave function. So this allows one to consider decays, for example, of this uh, S to hidden sector states, in particular, for example, to a technical glue balls or technical pions, if they exist in the theory. Um, another interesting feature of these uh, quonium states is that uh, higher uh, end states, this, this means higher radial excitations of, of these bound states, are typically split by just a few percent. 
And um, this can, in fact, be used to fake a broad SPIC in the Diphoton uh, data. Because, so on, on the, on the right-hand side, I'm showing the current spectrum uh, of, of Atlas with its current binning, which is of the order of 20 GV. And in this crude binning that is currently available, one cannot discern several closely spaced resonances. Um, however, uh, this should be discernible with more data uh, in the, the photo mass spectrum, because the, the invariant mass resolution is much better than what is currently uh, being publicly presented. And in particular, just for illustration, I'm showing on the upper plot, I'm showing the corresponding spectrum, what we'll see if the experimental, ex assuming an experimental resolution of 1%. So this spectrum above, once one averages or, or sums over the, the atlas beans, results in a perfect fit to the current uh, atlas data. But in fact, on, on close inspection, one would actually uh, expect to see several resonances lying there. OK, so let me conclude uh, with this example, simple example. I think that the current Current experimental hits, hints of a diphoton excess of 750 GV uh, are tantalizing, uh, yet unfortunately inconclusive. Um, what we know already is that they should be at some point accompanied by resonances at 750 GV decaying to uh, ZZWW and or Z gamma final states, at least two of those. Um, now, at the moment, fitting current data to new physics model is rather easy. Uh, as you can infer from observing the more than 200 papers that have been published so far uh, on, on this success. Um, at, the same point, at the same time, the large apparent width preferred by ATLAS uh, would point towards uh, strong interaction models or possible multiple states. Um, and also, the absence of signals in other decay modes beside the electroweak decays might motivate connections with dark matter. Um, in the future, it will be, of course, paramount to probe alternative and additional production and decay modes uh, to test the preferred quantum numbers of S, uh, both uh, CP, spin, and uh, electroweak uh, quantum numbers. And uh, these alternative uh, decay or production modes can also be used as probes of the total width and can test possible UV realizations of S. So at this point, I can maybe venture a, a robust prediction that in July, with the uh, 2016 uh, data set of Atlas and CMS, uh, we, can we can already expect a mass model extinction event uh, to occur. OK, thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Jernay. Um, I guess it was very interesting to talk, in fact. it was. Well, worth to, to, to follow it. So uh, before to start with the question, now I'm just going to tell to the people that is following this, the streaming of this webinar that you can make questions. If you are already in the, in the Google Plus event of this webinar, you, you can just have to click in the upper right part of the screen, and there is a Q&A uh, button. So if you want any quest to make any question, you have just to write it there, and we are going to address it to Jernay. So maybe if the, we can pass to the question from the people that is here in the Hangout session. If you have any question, please unmute yourself. Uh, OK, OK. I have a, ah. yeah, sorry, I have a, a, a question. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, it, is, it is evident that we need to see uh, events with um, uh, with uh, z, uh, two Zs or one Z and a, and a photo, so that clearly will uh, affect the the width. So, regarding your initial plots, how does the 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 picture change if you consider the fact that it will be producing Zs and Z gammas? Um, so, you're referring to which initial uh, plot? Right. In, initially, you just considered that uh, you had uh, couplings to two photons ah, or two gluons. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me let me show you. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So you see, um, on on this plot, I already considered the possibility of having an additional decay mode to electroweak gauge bosons. 
And in particular, you see there is a WW uh, in red. Oh, yes, yes. There's a WW. You don't see the ZZ and Z gamma at all because they are already so much constrained that they, they cannot appreciably contribute to the total decay rate. Oh, I see. OK? Because they can be, at most, a factor of a few uh, more frequent than the gamma gamma. And we know that the gamma gamma mm -hmm. cannot be the dominant component in the width. Because if it was, then the 8 and 13 TV data compatibility would suffer. OK. I understand. OK, so, so just a, a second question uh, would be, um, so what would be, um, what, what should we expect then in, 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 in July? So what channels should we on the, on the, on the, should we be on, on the lookout for? Um, should we expect, uh, say, uh, for leptoman analysis? Uh, what, what kind of, of data do you, I, I don't know if, you, if, if you're aware, uh, yeah, uh, should we expect? The, the ones which I personally would uh, most eagerly uh, await would be the Z gamma. Uh, mm -hmm. Z gamma, the ZZ, uh, and then the digits. Because it's very difficult oh, to, to have a this thing produced and not uh, appearing in digits. Right. Ne nevertheless, that, th that those channels would work mostly to confirm this excess. But w would they be of any use to, to, to exclude other models? Yeah, so maybe let me go to, let me see, here, right? So you see in, in, this, uh, in this plot, you see that the um, right now the constraints are, are shown. The current constraints are shown. Now imagine you push the the z gamma uh, the z gamma bound to be below um, uh, below the diphoton bound the signal. Okay. So for mm -hmm. r z gamma to be below one. Mm -hmm. If you do that, yeah. then you see that you have a definite prediction that uh, ZZ and WW should both be uh, of order one or larger. Right. So at, at the point where all these three modes are pushed below the gamma gamma, so if, if the Z gamma, ZZ, and WW turn out to be all constrained to be below 5 femtobar, then the whole thing becomes very, very difficult to explain. I see. Because then you cannot use EFT, because EFT is at that point, EFT is uh, violated. OK. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So is there any, uh, another question? Maybe for the other participants, otherwise we can at least we can start with one of the questions from the for the followers in, in of the streaming. The first time I'm gonna talk is about the one from uh, Avelino Vicente that he's first of all he's acknowledged you for the very nice review and he's asking if if you could please comment on how to use the vector Boson fusion production to test the scenarios with invisible SDKs. Okay, yeah. So basically, um, what happens is that once you determine your uh, dominant production mode, for any given dominant production mode, you predict the corresponding VBF product, VBF uh, signal. Um, and if this prediction only depends, then at this point only depends on the total width of, of S. And so if you account for all the modes of S into, st into the standard model states, and you see that the, you constrain the VBF production below a certain value, you know you have to have contributions to the width which go beyond the standard model states. At this point, you know you have other decay modes of S which you are not uh, seeing, which you have not constrained. Um, so this is 
this is in the same paper, this, uh, this one that discusses this SU2 invariance. It's discussed in detail. Unfortunately, I don't think I have any plots on this, but uh, they are in the paper. So, as I said, so for any given production mode, there is an upper bound on the VBF production. So this is basically production associated with two jets, where you put uh, the typical VBF cuts on the two jets. Um, and so there is, a, there is always a, a lower expected value of the VBF um, for any given production mode if the total width is saturated with the standard mode final states. If you violate this, then you have other decay modes besides the standard mode ones. Okay, uh, and now I just have a general reply and said thanks for the for the answer. <laughs> so, uh, meanwhile, I can start with one of the other questions. Is I mean, this is a question that is, uh, which is the future strategy kind of to break the degeneracy, the model the degeneracy in the case of uh, composite states, since there are, could be many solutions for the same problem. Maybe the, some of these models they have different signatures in different yes. channels. I don't. Know. Yeah, exactly. So, um, for example, uh, in typically in models of um, uh, where this uh, S is a part of a Goldstone sector involving the Higgs, uh, then one typically expects S to decay to TT bar or di Higgs. So expect a resonance in di Higgs, a resonance in TT bar. Uh, on the other hand, this is not expected for example, in this Qonium picture. In this Qonium picture, you expect, on the other hand, colored resonances, which are degenerate with S, and also you expect uh, spin 1 resonances, which are almost degenerate with S. And on the other hand, if I, again, in this uh, Goldstone picture, you this S can actually be separated a little bit in, in mass with the rest of the spectrum. So in those models, you don't expect additional spin-1 resonances being very, very close to, to the mass of S. So this is one example. where So at the end, it will be probably several, uh, several different observables which will be needed to, to pinpoint what is going on. Mm -hmm. I see. So and another question that is about the in the case of these perturbative models in which you have loops in, in inside the loops different uh, new fermions especially uh, if there is an, any kind of further constraint on these kind of exotic fermions that number of fermions or of masses or can it be can they be light or or they uh, can be very heavy? yeah so um, so um, we know that uh, in order to induce a coupling to photons, uh, they need to be charged. So, um, having charged new massive charged fermions, one can use existing direct surge bounds on these. And um, these typically uh, lie in the ballpark of uh, 100 to 300 GeV. So, one can for sure, one cannot have new charged fermions lighter than about 100 GeV, because these are subject to lab constraints, uh, which are the most uh, robust. But if even uh, at the LHC, unless one makes the decays quite intricate, then one be, will be subject to more severe constraints coming from the LHC, and then these will be uh, closer to like 300 GeV. Um, now, the optimal range to get the maximal effect in the loop of these fermions uh, in inducing an S to gamma gamma is, in fact, when the, their masses are roughly half the mass of, of S, meaning that they are about 400 GeV in mass. So this is, at the moment, this is perfectly consistent uh, in general. This is perfectly consistent with direct searches uh, and would be the maximal possible effect one can get. If these fermions would, are lighter, than half the mass, then their effect in the loop starts to decouple. So in the Carroll limit, they, are, they, de they decouple. And also in the heavy limit, if their masses are much heavier than S, then again, they decouple. Um, I hope this answers the, the question. 
Yeah, yeah, in fact, this is one of the, the ideas that I, I mean, the, what I was trying to see if there are constraints or not, like you were saying. So the, we have another question that is, this time is from Jan Mambrini. And his, I mean, uh, his question is follow, it's very long, let's see. Uh, uh, when talking about the violation of weak isospin invariance, one should add that the ratio uh, set to gamma gamma uh, so, uh, uh, host, can you, sorry, because he host, he, he just removed the question. If he can put it back, I could continue. Uh, okay, I, I found it. Okay, when talking about the, I'm going to start again. When talking about violation of weak exospin invariance, one should add that the ratio uh, R gamma gamma set set not conform with the weak relation. Does it, sorry. That not meet a violation of isospin, but for instance, intermediate states with four collimated photons? This is the, the question. I don't know if you can. Ah, ah, I see. So in case, in case one would, these, uh, this thing, if I understand correctly, the question is <coughs> what uh, the experiments are seeing are not actually the case to die photons, but the case to, uh, to some intermediate state, which then decays to collimated photons. Yeah, I guess and that's the. In that case, one would expect also uh, Z gamma, uh, Z Z, and so forth. Um, well, in fact, I don't. Uh, I don't think the the signature would look exactly like this. Um, so all the conclusions that I had were assuming S is actually decaying to die photons. If S is decaying in a more complicated way, then of course. These uh, implications can be can be different. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it, there is another question. Yes. I have one too. Okay. Please continue. Can I ask one? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. sure. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Hi, Erne. How you doing? Thanks for the talk. Um, so people have tried to explain the. Um, the the Higgs, for example, have tried to fix all the Higgs data with with a light dilaton. And one of the concerns is that to get a light dilaton, even as light as 125 GeV, requires a lot of fine tuning and uh, large uh, explicit breaking of conformal invariance. Wouldn't this be worse in the case of a, of a 750 GeV scalar, if it, if it is to be the dilaton? Um, yeah, so it's true that um, the dilaton is, uh, is not uh, um, is not a very elegant solution to this, uh, precisely for the reason that you're saying. One needs to have a large breaking, one large departures from the limit of conformal invariance uh, to make it work. Uh, this I actually have it in the in the backup slide. Now. Let me see the case of the dilaton. <clears throat> yes. So the reason is the following: in the case of the dilaton, since the the couplings of of the dilaton to um, to fermions and to the to the Higgs are are fixed, no, mm -hmm. uh, by by conformal invariance, and then uh, in this case you you get a, a severe constraint coming from uh, the dilaton actually wanting to decay to T T bar and diluting all the other rates. Um, and so, it, so in the dilaton, of course, the dominant contributions to, to relative decays are coming from uh, from the uh, from the loops of of whatever uh, matter is is coupling to it. Um, while, but the problem is that, of course, whatever you put there uh, will be diluted severely if the dilaton couples to, to the top. Okay. And what, so one needs to somehow break this um, in order to, to try to fit the data. Uh, so at the end, uh, so it turns out that uh, I think it's at the moment it's already clear that it's inconsistent to try to interpret the 750 as a dilaton and having the Higgs as a pseudo Goldstone boson. Okay. I cannot have both at the same time. Okay, and also in in the dilaton case, it is possible that the dilaton can mix with the Higgs in some way, right? Uh, through some 
Um, uh, yeah. Some kin kinetic mixing or something like that. Yes. Okay. And that that's even worse if you try to make the top a composite of uh, the conformal sector, exactly. correct? Okay. Exactly. exactly. So there, there is a there was a a proposal um, which was phrased in terms of uh, an RS model, an extra dimensional model, mm -hmm. where they they interpret the radian as the 750, so which would be equivalent to a dilaton in a 4D setting, and uh, uh, they show that one actually it's the mixing uh, with the Higgs, so they, they tune the mixing with the Higgs in a way to to explain the data. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll check that reference. Thanks, Yane. Yeah, welcome. Okay, I think I don't know if there are other questions from the from the people here or in 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 the Q and A. Let me just check. Otherwise, I think it's, it's okay for today. I mean, it was very interesting. In fact, I guess there are still many questions, but later on, the people will look in archive and so on and going to discover what is what is happening with this 750 GeV resonance, the photon excess. So I guess, first of all, to acknowledge the journey for this very nice talk and explanation and everything. And I guess we can start to say bye for the next webinar. And just let me talk to the people that our next speaker that is going to be next week is going to be uh, Ricardo Sturani. And we're going to have a talk about all the observational gravitational waves. In this case, the, in the case of the recent uh, observa uh, discovery of these such a waves. So I guess for my side is everything that I had to say, and I think we can see we can say goodbye and see it for the next time for the next webinar. Okay. So, thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Bye. 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 Bye.